Hi, welcome to Genre Chat for SeriousWriter.com. I'm Caleb Walton, and tonight I'm really excited to welcome Tina Yeager back to the show. How are you doing, Tina? Fantastic. How are you this evening? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I appreciate your patience. We're sort of through a few technical difficulties there, but I'm glad I'm glad we could get started. It's always, always fun to talk with you. I've been enjoying watching you on uh, the First in Fiction podcast and on the different things you've got going on. You've got some exciting news coming up. You've got a book launch. Didn't you say it was Monday? Monday. Yes. I'm so excited and a little nervous because there's so much left to do. <laughs> so, I bet so. I bet so. It seems like it would be a lot to me. Are you doing like a book launch on Facebook or somewhere on social media? I have a launch party that day. I'm going to be on my local radio show that morning. So I have all kinds of stuff going on that day. So it'll be really exciting. I have all kinds of awesome. events to do. So That is awesome. It must be so cool to work so long on a project and then see that just be complete and and just have that process end in in such a uh, an awesome way you know with with book launch and with seeing it in stores and everything on amazon and and all that stuff sort of a sigh of relief i guess that it's it 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 finally that it's finally done what genre is it it is uh christian living women's nonfiction. Awesome. I wanted to talk a little bit about that, about the nonfiction for women with the inspirational Christian market and how you were inspired to write the book. What's it called? It's called Beautiful Warrior, Finding Victory Over the Lies Formed Against You. That's awesome. That is awesome. What inspired you to write that or to write in that genre in general? As a counselor, because I'm a licensed mental health counselor, I used to have a private practice and I saw lots of women over and over again. Every single one of them came in with issues related to self-esteem and believing they did not have worth or purpose or significance. Mm -hmm. And I knew that all too well because I had suffered with self-esteem issues myself. Because mm -hmm. I related to it and because I worked with it so often, I knew there were only so many women that I could reach in person either with speaking or with counseling or with life mm -hmm. coaching. I needed a vehicle to be able to get that message of busting through those shame lies, those cultural misconceptions that we have about femininity and getting women to really understand mm -hmm. their Christ-centered significance and worth and purpose. And that's why I wrote the book. That's amazing. And that is a really important message, especially in today's culture when there's so much discouragement and so much idolizing, you know, it, just all the pressure to be perfect and all the pressure to live up to these different expectations when it's, you just have to live up to God's expectations, which is just to be loved and to, to find your, your beauty in him. So that's amazing that you did that. Um, how long have you been working on that? Years. And I know that's discouraging for some people and encouraging for other people. And everyone works at a different pace. But this book was particularly difficult because it had personal elements. So when you're writing your own story, it's like mm -hmm. editing like this. Your own yeah. personal story is very difficult. So I did get some help. I got Eva Marie Everson to edit the book, and she did an amazing oh, job. I remember going to oh. her and saying, this is such a mess. I know this message needs to get to women, but it's an absolute disaster right now, and I can't publish it in the state that it's in. Can you please help me? Because it's too hard for me to do this myself. So she agreed to be my first editor, and then I was with New Hope Publishers and Ramona Richards, which if you're in publishing, if you've been to writers' conferences, you've probably heard her name, because mm -hmm. she's been nominated as Editor of the Year multiple times for a good reason. She's fantastic, and she was my editor at New Hope Publishers, and I'm grateful that that's who I have as my editor. That is awesome. That's, and it really is a team effort. Writing really is a team effort. Um, I forgot who it was that I heard say this, but they, you know, they always say it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to write a book. And a lot of times the author is just the one doing the grunt work. <laughs> so Absolutely. People think of writing as just the, the, the glamorous, you know, sipping tea and, and just writing all your thoughts out and everything being brilliant. But it's really just making a mess on a piece of paper and then everybody helping, <laughs> helping you make it work. <laughs> and it becomes a beautiful mess when we're done. So it, it is a it's, really it's important a thing to have friends and uh, encouragement and fellowship as well as good editors. So. Well, what all did you help discover for yourself as you were sort of writing this journey down? Because I, I assume it took not only a lot of it, it's always pouring your soul onto the paper when you're writing of any kind, but especially when you're writing your own story, doing a lot of soul searching and a lot of, of digging in there. What are some things that you found encouragement for and, and some things that helped you in that process? 
I had to learn to be vulnerable on the page in writing this book. And I thought I was fine with that. I, I could mm -hmm. write pretty much anything. I've written all kinds of genres. I've mm -hmm. written devotionals. I've written other nonfiction work. I've written articles. I've written lots of fiction in different genres. Mm -hmm. but writing your own personal story is very hard. And I discovered just how hard it was when I went to write about my past experiences mm -hmm. with pain and despair and low self-esteem and how hard that mm -hmm. was to put that onto the paper. So it's very important to understand up front. Yes, it's going to be hard, but of all the things that you write, your story is yours. And it's probably the most worthwhile thing you will ever put on paper. It's the hardest thing to put on paper, but it's the most deserving thing that you can put on the paper. So don't balk from it. Don't shrink back from it. Do it anyway. If you're called to write your story, do it as hard as it is and get people who will encourage you because you'll face discouragement during that process. But make sure that you don't quit. That's the hard part. <laughs> don't quit. Don't give up because that would be so much easier. And I bet even you were probably tempted to do that throughout the process, which is oh, probably yeah. a it's so encouraging to see you at the end of that with the book finished about to do the book launch and that's something that other writers can take encouragement from that there is a light at the end of that tunnel and that all that hard work does pay off it does it absolutely does just hearing feedback from a few people that have read the book i've gotten a few advanced copies and i was able to sell them in, in um, mm -hmm. little small places that i've been pre-launch and just hearing the feedback of this really touched me. I thought I had no problems with self-esteem, but when I read this, I realized I still had so many shame lies to work through. And those kinds of comments are what make it all worth it. All of that time that you put into, you know, hashing out your personal story mm -hmm. is worth doing when you realize Absolutely. that you can touch people. So. so for people that are trying to write, uh, especially for women and for non, you know, in, in the inspirational market, uh, people who are trying to write their own story, what's a good first step for that person that has a story that has a message that they want to get out and they don't know where to start because it's so overwhelming. What's a good place to begin? Well, make sure that you are in groups with people who are writers of nonfiction. Make sure that you listen to podcasts mm -hmm. by people that are podcasting to women in nonfiction areas that you're writing about. Get into interest groups mm -hmm. centered around your theme and your message. Listen to what people need. So your story is going to meet a need, but you need to pick the parts of your story that are meeting the needs of the audience that you're trying to reach. You don't need, want to write all of your story. You just want to write the parts of your story that are going to resonate mm -hmm. with the audience. So you need to connect with your audience first and know mm -hmm. what parts of your story you're going to write. You also need to just write it out and get it all vomited out onto the paper in a big, big mess. Then you can go back and edit it later. Make sure you get it all out, but also make sure that you're doing things that are going to help you filter which pieces are going to be relevant and which are going to go into the book. Because some of it will get cut. I had pieces, I had a whole chapters that I cut out of my book. And mm -hmm. it wasn't because Eva told me to edit it. After she was working with me, it helped me a little bit to be objective. Just having somebody with me in that process helped me be a little bit more objective. So I would encourage you to get other people with you on the process. And don't mm -hmm. rush. Whatever you do, don't rush. Because your, your story is worth doing well. Take the time that it takes to get it to be beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, that's a lot. There is so much, especially when you're telling something of your own experiences, you want to include every little detail, but I guess it would be, it is important to define your, what your, the core message is and then make sure everything that you said does surround that. What are some things that helped you do that to sort of, to sort of streamline the message and streamline the book? I had to come up with some themes that were going to run through the whole book. I had to come up mm -hmm. with certain messages that I knew were relevant to the overall women's self-esteem and identity message. And I had to make sure every chapter lined up with that. But every chapter mm -hmm. was also giving a distinct and important piece of that that wasn't just repeating the same information over and over again. Personally, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, mm -hmm. I hate it when I pick up a book that says the same thing over and over again for 200 pages. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read those Thank books? You. And it doesn't mm -hmm. really give you something new in each chapter. I think every chapter needs to have a new significant piece of information that's going to be beneficial and worth the reader's time. 
So make sure you're giving new information in each chapter, but also all of it needs to go under that big umbrella and fit in the theme. Absolutely. And you do find that a lot of times with certain nonfiction books that they do just say the same theme over and over and over again, or even, and I'm trying to figure out how to word this, even give you information that you, you already know. Like it, it, you need a fresh perspective on the topic. Uh, everybody knows that there are self-esteem issues and everyone knows that people will say to find your beauty in God. But how you go about that and how you approach that and the scripture that backs it up and the mindset that backs it up, people want to go in there to learn, you know, more about it and not just reinforce what they already know. And nonfiction, good nonfiction is all about takeaway. What are you going Absolutely. to give your reader to take away that's going to change their life? If you don't have that, you don't have a nonfiction book. Absolutely. Now, do you have different like steps or workbooks or things at the end of each chapter, or at the end of the book, like just life application things? Yes, I have reflective questions at the end of each chapter. And mm -hmm. most of the chapters also have like a clinical step for you to take, just like a practical tool for you to apply to your life. Go through this. <laughs> there are some questions. These are some scriptures that are, are for you to kind of reflect on certain things that you can use, you can actually put to implementing in your life to help you develop those skills and make those changes and grow in that direction. Now, I know you have a lot of experience in mental health counseling and things like that. What all research did you do for the book besides drawing from your own knowledge of, of that area? Because it has taken years to develop this book, I had researched other books beforehand, so it's really difficult mm -hmm. to tease that out. That some of this came from a chapter in a book that I started to write probably eight or nine years ago that was mm -hmm. going to be about uh, love yourself and love God and love others. And I kept getting the same response from publishers that that's too big of a message, it's too big of a theme. Mm -hmm. So I decided I was going to talk about all of those things from the perspective of self-esteem, loving yourself. So I really do address all of that in this book, but I do it from one perspective. And that can happen too. So if you're writing and you keep getting negative feedback, it may not be a no, it may be a not yet, or your book is not ready yet, or you need to look at it from a different mm -hmm. angle. So I did do research, but how much research I did on this form of the book compared to what I had done before is kind of hard to, to tease out. So I'm sorry, I can't really say, I know I got a lot of it from my already existing clinical background and information and mm -hmm. things that have worked with clients that I worked with. And as well as other things that I've written that are biblical things, I had already done a lot of the biblical research. So mm -hmm. I did do some more biblical research. I researched some celebrities and their lives and things that worked for them and didn't work for them and some other things that went into the book that I hadn't done before. I, like, for example, I talk about Princess Diana in the book. So I did some research mm -hmm. to bring her and help her be included in that story because we're all princesses suffering on our own when we think no one else relates to us and yet we mm -hmm. all suffer from similar self-esteem issues. Now, so, if I understand right, outlining is crucial for nonfiction. I know fiction writers can can sort of do the seat of the pants writing or some people call it organic writing, but outline is just outlining is very, very crucial for when you're writing nonfiction. Did you have an outline from the very beginning of everything the book was going to include and did you stick from stick with that like very strictly or did you sort of let it shape itself? I let it I am a I am what they call a pantser. I don't like that word. I like organic. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it I am sounds, an organic, better. Uh, writer. Uh, uh, organic writer. It sounds yeah. um, I am an <laughs> organic fiction writer. So I actually did approach some of this in an organic way because a lot of it is story driven. It talks mm -hmm. about my story. However, I had to go back and go through and do the outlining later, which means more editing. So when you're organic, you definitely have to put that outline in somewhere. And because mm -hmm. I approached it organically, it made a little bit of a mess for me to have to clean up. So that was mm -hmm. part of the reason why I had such a big, this doesn't go here, this doesn't go here mess that I had to get Eva to help me with when I first came. I almost didn't publish this book because it was such a mess, but I knew that it was a needed message. And that's what made me keep going. 
And that's something that organic writers, especially new writers, need to keep in mind is if that is the way you get your story out and that's how you get all of your ideas out, that is an excellent way to write a novel. But it does take a lot more cleanup work on the back end. Mm -hmm. There's, there's got to be some trimming because there's no way when you're looking at it this closely, there's no way for you to see the big picture like there is with an outline, even if it does give you a little bit more freedom creatively. I've even seen nonfiction writers write things on post-it notes and then go back and stick them on a big board. So that's a way if you're not... Your audio cut out for just a second. Could you repeat that? I've seen nonfiction writers. John Eldridge, I think it was, was doing a, a video where he said he uses post-it notes on a big whiteboard mm -hmm. and he has his subjects and he puts, and that's the mark of kind of an organic mindset mm -hmm. because you're spatial relational. You're writing mm -hmm. this and it's, it's flowing, but it doesn't necessarily go at the beginning and you can switch it around that way. Scrivener mm -hmm. kind of works that way if you like. To I, I was just about to bring up Scrivener because it has that application where you can do the little sticky notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm a visual person, so that would work perfectly for me. I can't keep it. I mean, I have to do, even outlining sometimes doesn't give me a big enough picture of like what the story looks like from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. I remember when the, the, one of the Lord of the Rings movies was coming out, they did a, a poster um, and it was sort of one image flowing into another. And it was the entire movie on a big poster like this, where you saw the very beginning and the very end of the dragon. And it was just each scene transitioning almost, at, almost like a panoramic view. Hmm. And ever since I saw that, I was like, that is how I mentally picture stories and things from beginning to end. But it's very hard to put that down in a practical way. <laughs> so that's a good, that's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah. And every, every book, even a nonfiction book has a story to tell. So you're mm -hmm. going to have a beginning. You need to have that introduction that draws people into the story, the, the truth, mm -hmm. the message. And then you have an end where you're going to wrap everything up and give them a takeaway and a call to action. This is how you're going to implement this in your life. So in mm -hmm. between are all the steps from here to here. It's very similar to the story. You don't have a conflict or an arc mm -hmm. like you do in a novel, but you have a beginning, you have a middle and you have an end. So if you're an organic writer, you simply need to know what's my beginning, mm -hmm. what's my end, and what are all the elements that are gonna go in between? You do need to research your audience's felt need and as it applies to your story, you know that all of those things are actually felt needs for your audience mm -hmm. and the rest. But you'll have like a chapter title on each of those and then you write one at a time and they don't have to be in order. That's another good thing about nonfiction. Doesn't necessarily have to be done in order. Because each chapter is going to have a new topic, whereas fiction is going to go, the story is going to go chronologically most of the time. Fiction, right. nonfiction is going to have a different topic, a different transition for every, yeah. every chapter. Unless, I mean, there might be certain nonfiction books mm -hmm. where it has to go in order. If you're doing steps to mm -hmm. the goal, then you might have to do them in order. But most of the time, mm -hmm. it's not necessary to have, to write and even them. then, you probably have a little bit more freedom to go from step mm -hmm. to step. You don't necessarily yeah. have to know exactly how this is going to flow out to know what the next step is going to be if you already have that planned out in your mind. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Write what you can write that day, and that way you don't have to get stuck. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are some other things that you've learned about the message that you wanted to tell as you finish this process, just giving the viewers a little bit of a sneak peek of what that journey is you're going to take the reader through. I, as far as the message is concerned, I learned how deep it goes and how connective it is. Mm -hmm. and how much uh, we all suffer from the same sorts of things. We get the same shame lie types, even though each of us gets them a different way. You might get it at a different level from a different angle, but we're, we're very similar in our suffering and we have a shared need and we don't even often realize it. So I did learn that. I also learned the power of collaboration, both in writing the story and as part of the message that I'm writing, because I'm all about collaboration rather than competition. No comparisons. Mm -hmm. Comparisons kill us, especially as women. Women are terrible about comparing ourselves to one another. So mm -hmm. I you know, learned about emphasizing that and the cultural culprits, the things that our culture does to us, to lie to us, to deceive us into thinking our worth is based on things that it isn't. So those are some research things that I, I learned about the message. 
that was important. And I also really began to discover how strong women are by nature. And mm-hmm. our strength is often misunderstood. Um, most people who try to see women as strong look at the feminist, masculine sort of picture of what Mm -hmm. a woman trying to not be weak looks like but women don't have to be men in order to be strong women and that's another thing that I learned how Mm -hmm. to really define and clarify that as well and that's something very important because that is a lot of what you hear in the secular culture and in the secular market is almost robbing the strength that femininity and, and womanhood has in and of itself without having to, to compare it or, or try to turn it into something else. Right. We don't have to be something we're not. We don't have to be men. Well, because God is, has, has, have you ever read the book Wild at Heart? Yes, I have. Dan Allender. It, mm-hmm. it went a lot and it was such an amazing book uh, for men and for women. I would assume, you know, women could, could get a lot of really awesome stuff from insight in that too, but it went into how, just as God in, in the characteristics he showed of himself in nature and in femininity and masculinity, there's, there's strength in both of those that is unlike the other elements. No, wait, that's uh, not Dan Allender. I'm sorry. That was John Eldridge, I think, isn't it? It may have been John. I have, it on, my, I have it on my bookshelf and I don't remember. I think it was. I do, I, do, I, do yeah. too. I have it on my bookshelf at home. There's uh, but another I think book it may have been John Eldridge. I think it was John Eldridge, as a matter of fact. That sounds really familiar. Um, but there was a lot of elements in there of how God has expressed his own nature in the strengths of men and the strengths of women and the weaknesses of both of the genders and, and how it's it's really not – it's not an apples-to-apples apples thing. You know, it's, it's, it's God expressing his character in different beautiful ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that so much. That's very important for us to recognize that we have a place, we have a part to play. It's Mm -hmm. not the same as someone else's part, but it's significant because it is unique and nobody else can fulfill that role. And as sisters in Christ, we all are meant to work together as sister Mm -hmm. warriors. We have a battle to fight and women have a significant part to play in the battle against evil Mm -hmm. for the kingdom of God. It's not a diminished part. It's not a less important part. It is a significant, important, irreplaceable mm-hmm. piece of God's purpose on the earth. So that is another thing that I found to be very, very important. And we don't have to steal our power from other people. Mm-hmm. That was another thing that I found to be very significant. A lot of women think they need to take their power from or take their mm-hmm. power back. And you don't have to. You have an inherent power that is given to you by God. It doesn't have to be stolen or taken back from anybody else. Right. That's right. What are some pitfalls? And I know you touched on this a little bit. Um, what are some pitfalls that you would warn other authors trying to write in this genre to avoid certain cliches or, or just certain things that you, mistakes that you made that you learned from that other people could avoid making? We always want to avoid cliches or delving into too much Christianese because your book may Mm -hmm. be targeting a Christian audience, but do you want to limit yourself to only reaching a Christian audience? So make sure that your book is understandable from other people who are not those who've grown up in the church hearing those words all the time. So these words that are going to be relatable to other people and make sure that you are also using language that isn't super academic and that's mm-hmm. one of the pitfalls I find. I, I try to I tend to wax very wordy and I have to go back and edit and make sure that I simplify, simplify, simplify. I have the same I've been problem. doing research and I get the I have that problem brain. when I speak and I have that problem when I write. <laughs> I want to give way more information than necessary. Yeah, yeah. So I have to I have to watch that. Make sure I simplify. I could leave some of the flowery in, but I can't mm-hmm. leave all of the flowery in. So um, I have to be careful of that. So that's something An to watch. interesting thing of talking about the Christianese uh, words that, that you want to avoid. I was at the Blue Ridge Conference last year, last May, and David Teams was the speaker for one of the keynotes. And he was talking about the importance of not trying to speak above people's heads. And he said, if you read... Um, Psalm, it's not Psalm, it's Philippians chapter 4, 
where it talks about whatever things are pure and lovely and honest and just. He said that's some of the most spiritually rich text in the Bible. And there's no Christianese language in there. There's nothing that anyone that walks off the street that has never gone to a church before can understand. Because it's simple, but it's still beautiful and rich in God's word and what his desire is without having to be too wordy. I like that. That's true. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, but are there any parting words that you would have for somebody that's just starting to write nonfiction, somebody that's stuck on a project or, or just trying to find a place to begin? Any, any last words of wisdom you have for them? Be sure to read the best-selling nonfiction authors. That'll give you a sense of how to speak with a conversational tone or find your voice and speak with the tone that's easy to understand and delivers with still an artful, craft, honed mm -hmm. way of, of writing and delivering a message. You definitely want to work on your craft by studying others, by getting in mm -hmm. writer's groups, Writers groups are absolutely essential to developing your craft as a mm -hmm. writer and for just ongoing nourishment of encouragement. We need those people around us or we as embers will go cold. We definitely absolutely. need to be in community with other writers, especially as Christian writers. Uh, we can become very, very discouraged in the ways that we get attacked on this process absolutely. of writing a story or, or a nonfiction book. So make sure that you get connected with writers' organizations. Go to conferences. Mm -hmm. Definitely go to conferences. Learn as much as you can. And all the while, keep writing. Keep practicing your, your work. Make sure that you see it as practice because if you write a few books, as I did, you may tend to be, th you may be tempted to think that they're a waste if they don't get published. But they're not wasted if they are practiced for the book that is eventually going to touch people's hearts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm really glad to have you back on the show. I always love talking yeah. with you. What, what's some contact information, some websites that people can go to? I know you have a website, tinayeager.com, is that right? That's my website, and my new podcast is on there. It's tinayeager.com slash flourishment, flourish-m-e-a-n-t. I'm also on Facebook. They can look for my book and my book launch party that's coming up on Monday. So that'll be exciting. And that'll be awesome. yeah, that'll be awesome. So those are the places that they can reach me. And the book is going to be released on Monday. Is that right? Yes. Book releasing on Monday. Monday. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, congratulations. That's thank exciting. You. Good luck with the book launch. And thank you so much for coming back on the show. Okay. Thanks for having me, Caleb. Thank you guys for watching and we will see you next time.